Hello again. My name is Katie Sill, and I'm an academic advisor at the University of Alaska Southeast Sitka campus. Today we're going to be talking about the Northwest Coast Indigenous Arts Program. Joining me are Liz Zacker and Mark Sixby. Ah, yes, I'm Mark Sixby. I'm a Sitka tribe of Alaska's traditional arts specialist. I teach classes here in Sitka. And what does it mean to be a traditional arts specialist? Well, it depends on the individual. In my case, so I do traditional Simpson wood carving, form line design, that sort of thing. Lumped into the wider Northwest Coast arts because there's so many tribes across this whole region that use a, you know, a similar visual language, if you will. And how did you get started in this career path? Some parts of it, you know, traditional culture with the, the Simpson people, much like the Slingit, you're born into your mother's clan. In our case, a Pitech is, is the word. So, Lakibu wolf clan. And with that, our whole society, you could say, is built around the maternal line. And carving, tool making, uh, all of that was a part of the traditional life. So it goes hands in hand with, with subsistence living, fishing, hunting, all that sort of thing. To break it down in, in kind of modern terms, I, I just tell people, like, it wasn't that many generations ago. There was no general store, no hardware store. If you wanted to fish, if you wanted to hunt, you had to make everything that you used for that. And I suppose the role of the carver in today's education system is kind of to link us to those, you know, to those older knowledges. Using modern terms, did you do an apprenticeship or was there any kind of formal schooling for you to get started in this? It felt like an apprenticeship in a lot of ways. Again, I grew up in Metlakatla. Jack Hudson, the second, so Jack Hudson the third teaches the class there now. He was probably in his 35th year of teaching when I came along and I was probably 11 or 12 uh, when I started. And every day is a whole school subject uh, in Metlakatla. So you start with how to draw your basic ovoids and U-shapes and, and the rules of form line and how things go together. But more importantly, what you use it to represent, which would be, again, your clan, your mother's clan. And all this is really important visually, you know, when you represent your family with regalia or the, you know, formal wear. When everybody gathers together as a community, we know how to tell each other, you know, you belong to that family. Okay, we have the Lucky Boo, the wolves over here, the ravens over there, the eagles. It's a bit different from Plinket and Haida where you have eagle, raven, and then everything else under. So without getting into all that, it's the same basic form, though. Again, there was a lot of community support for the program there. Jack, you know, he, he built the program that I luckily walked into. It took a lot of years to get it to where it was. You know, you build up your resources, your methods, your tools, and your facility even. You know, things like that evolve over time. But yeah, you start with drawing and then painting. And then when I was 15, he showed me how to make my first set of carving tools. That's another class I teach at UAS here. Again, we start with circular saw blades, you know, old ones. And we will cut those up into little rectangles and grind them into shape, put an edge on them, heat them up red hot, bend them temper them, carve wooden handles for them, and then, you know, set, wrap, polish, embellish with abalone. Anyhow, you, you have to do all these things to make your tools to learn to carve. Then wood carving. So that was probably from 15 to graduated at 17. But then fast forward 10 years uh, after, after some college and some Marine Corps time and living in the city and whatnot, I moved back to Alaska. And one of my first jobs was working for my old art teacher, training up the new batch of students, you know, from 7th to 12th grade. Anyhow, so that's a bit of what I was able to bring up here. We, again, a, there's a strong, strong formal art program in Metlakatla. And I understand that Sitka may not be quite at that level yet, but there's a lot of opportunity for young people in our community to be able to tap into this aspect of traditional education. A lot of what we do at the University of Alaska Southeast with our Northwest Coast Indigenous Arts Program deals with dual enrollment. Liz, could you talk a little bit more about how that works for our Northwest Coast Indigenous Arts classes? Yeah, I'm Liz Zacker. I am assistant professor of art at the UAS Sitka campus, and I help co-coordinate our Northwest Coast Indigenous Arts programs. 
So I can speak to both the dual enrollment and just the program itself and how important our partnerships are in order to make these educational opportunities available and possible. So we have a a wonderful partnership with Sitka Tribe of Alaska. They help co-sponsor classes, both dual enrollment and otherwise. And in that, what they do is they provide funding to help pay for instructors to make uh, tuition more affordable for students and also help cover cost of registration fees for tribal citizens and materials. We also have a strong partnership with Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. They provide a lot of funding to help support programs like this across the region. And we've partnered with other entities as well, like Gold Belt Heritage. And so within that, the dual enrollment classes are providing an opportunity for students in Sitka High, Pacific High, and even at Mount Edgecombe now, they're able to take classes and earn both high school credit and college credit. And some of these classes are high impact learning experiences where they're also general education requirements and they fulfill Alaska Native Knowledge graduation requirements. And so much of this would not be possible without these very crucial partnerships that we have benefited from having. And when it comes to the specific high schools that you mentioned, are we only talking about Sika high schools or are there high schools in the region that are also participating as well? Actually, yes, there are other high schools in the region that are participating. There's a couple of high schools in Juneau and um, and the Kalak School District is also participating. And there's kind of a region-wide initiative to try to help bring these dual enrollment opportunities to other communities as well. And Mark, like you were saying, it's really important for people to have these experiences early on. What is it like to get those students into those experiences, some of them for the very first time? Well, I guess a little background. I've been working in and around Sitka, you could say traditional arts education for about seven or eight years now with all ages uh, up until quite recently. So now I'm focused in on on the UAS dual credit. And so my my students are all Pacific High School in Mount Edgecombe uh, in the same room, which hasn't happened uh, before, to my knowledge, Uh, (laughs) certainly not in a carving class. And so I've had a lot of short term you know, classes. So it could be a weekend workshop. It could be an appearance in a school. It could be a week with the art class in the middle school or, you know, substituting in the high school. It all adds up. I've noticed that students that have had a number of, uh, we'll say form line in particular, workshops over the years, they do retain uh, every one of those experiences. It's, it's always interesting to see. It's, it's almost like a grand experiment. Give me 10 students and you're going to get 10 different outcomes they're still going to work at their own pace and they're still going to work to, to satisfy their own standards and expectations too. You're, you're always going to get students that have that extra meticulous nature and others are like, okay, what's next? What's next? It's never too late, but definitely the earlier you start, especially with the, we'll say the cultural uses of art, the earlier you can start them, the more I suppose the student can internalize and have ownership, you know, particularly our Alaska Native students, you know, their access to their own history. There's a lot of responsibility that goes into passing down this knowledge in culturally appropriate way without touching in on cultural appropriation. Liz, Mark, do you guys have any guidelines that kind of help carry forward the way that we introduce this content to students, whether they are Alaska Native students or non-Native students? How do we introduce these concepts in a culturally responsive and appropriate way? The wider answer to that, and it is a, it's a very common question. I, I refer to the, the wise words of Cindy Lauper, Money changes everything. And so it's one thing to take a class and and learn things, but then, you know, what do you do with that? It's not as prevalent in Sitka as as you'll see in Juneau or Ketchikan's downtown districts. The shopping districts have a tremendous amount of imported, quote unquote, native style carvings. But I'm not teaching anybody how to mass produce things and, and all the dirty stuff secrets out there, you know, in business. That's, that, that's, that's so on another planet from what we're teaching in the classroom. 
Yeah, and I would just kind of follow up with saying in, in my work and coordinating and working with a lot of our different instructors that help support this programming is that I think across the board, each of our instructors at the very beginning of almost every class, they, they speak quite frankly about issues regarding cultural appropriation and, you know, just having an open dialogue about the ethics surrounding traditional arts. You know, we welcome all into the classroom and, you know, we find Native and non-Native students alike when we have a diverse student body. You know, we may have students that are coming into a classroom, maybe they're teachers who are wanting to perhaps find ways to get tools to integrating art and culture into their classrooms. They may be students in in these classes, and so they're getting hands-on experience to learn more deeply about the ethics regarding Native traditional art and culture and finding ways to appropriately embed that into their classrooms. And so I guess, yeah, just having that part of the curriculum is really important and everybody's going to have different perspectives on it. And so having that conversation right away is, is really key. And, and, and the other, the other thing, again, general response I have is you'll be okay if you're true to yourself. For example, if I really love Egyptian art, I think it's amazing. I think the history there, all of the, you know, the meaning behind it is really cool. Am I going to you know, employ my carving skills to make some knockoff Egyptian. No, I'm not going to do that. And when you put it like that, most people understand what you're talking about. And I'm sure the partnerships that we mentioned before with Sea Alaska, Sika Tribe of Alaska kind of help navigate those conversations through their co-sponsored format of the classes. You were mentioning to me before, when it comes to co-sponsorship, it provides a unique opportunity for Native people and tribe members, organization members, to be able to have access to these learning opportunities that they may not have had before. How does the co-sponsorship format make these experiences more accessible to students? So with a college class, typically, you know, a university has to charge tuition to be able to pay for the, you know, the faculty salary. And so with these co-sponsored partnerships, the partner organization typically will pay for the instructor's salary, therefore making the tuition reduced to a very nominal registration fee. You know, so comparatively, being able to take a class that would typically maybe cost $1,000 in tuition is now only $90. And oftentimes these partner organizations also cover those registration fees as well for their tribal members, as well as providing scholarships for, you know, covering material fees and expenses. It, and also recruiting and hiring and paying the instructors. That's, yep. And that's not a small aspect of, of this whole thing. I, I will just say in general, the co-sponsorship model, it makes these experiences possible in the first place. Say for my dual credit class, it took a meeting between the University of Alaska Southeast Sitka campus director, the uh, Mount Edgecombe principal, the Pacific High principal, you know, myself and the Sitka tribe management. You know, because I'm I'm not just I'm not just in, a lone individual sent over to the university. You know, I'm part of a department of the Cultural Resources and Education Department of Sitka Tribe of Alaska. Yeah, I guess, and I would also just add to that idea of how we've been able to reach other students and tribal citizens in the era of Zoom is, you know, I've been seeing regionally with our partners, they've been able to provide cultural learning opportunities to, you know, tribal citizens that may have moved away from the region, you know, so there's folks that, you know, maybe grew up here that are now living in Philadelphia, and they can have access to traditional arts and culture education while being away from their ancestral homelands. And as a visual artist, most carvers I know who are also in education found that you can point a camera at a piece of paper and do your craft while narrating, and that has translated very well to the online learning environment. Yeah, you were mentioning before that social media has really kind of broken down the isolation of what used to be only happening in these small communities throughout the region. But now you can go on to Instagram or you can go on to one of these co-sponsored programs and be able to engage with folks and build that network of communication a little more easily. Well, and also in the wider conversation, you know, tribal organizations uh are involved in every facet of life, of government, 
And so the visual aspect of our traditional art, the imagery is profoundly important for, oh, just the discourse of modern life. Anything from grand openings to, to ribbon cuttings to, it could be an environmental issue, it, it could be social justice related, it could be, you know, again, just education, local hometown news. You're, you're going to see a person in regalia. How many times have you seen a news article with just a picture of a totem pole? Kutia. My favorite word, kutia. I used to work at the park, and we would teach people that word. Everybody repeat after me, kutia, and they say, kutia, and look at it. And then I gesture over to one, this is a kutia. It's a large red cedar sculpture, you know, made by the Tlingit people. Anyhow, where were we? Well, I think just one other thing I'd like to add is one of the things that Zoom has also been able to help with is bringing in other cultural knowledge experts into the classroom, whether they're here physically in Sitka or not. You know, we can have, you know, a visiting lecturer who can come and talk about, you know, their perspectives, their unique training about their art specialty, or even maybe they're a language educator. And so we can kind of approach these classes in a, like a cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary way where we're embedding art and language, culture, and even talking about things like governance and and just also the wide array of different career pathways one can take. You know, this isn't necessarily courses that are just there to train artists. It's there to train good humans who have more deeper knowledge about uh, the place that they're living and learning from and how that can kind of help support any career pathway. Yeah, and I look at, in my dual enrollment class, I think of our 11 students, 10 of them, it's their first university course. I mean, we're talking, they can be 14 to 17 years old. And uh, and again, that's profound. When you tell them, oh, you've got a university student number now. They go, oh, hey, neat, you know. A thing that I've heard a lot of them say is, wow, you know, I never even pictured myself ever even going to college, you know, let alone taking a college class now. And that's probably the thing I'm most proud of every day that goes by. I want it to be safe. You know, again, we have carving tools and, and things like that. You want to mitigate risk. But I'm also very conscious of the fact that we're getting them, you know, one day closer to graduation. Now, you've mentioned carving a lot. There are other types of arts that we do. Liz, what are some of them? Within the general, like, associate's degree program, there's design classes, carving, woolen weaving, like raven's tail, basketry. And then there are, on occasion, other special topics in say, jewelry. Then there's uh, lecture-based classes like Northwest Coast Indigenous Art History and Culture, Northwest Coast Art Theory and Practice, Indigenous Performing Arts, as well as some classes that focus on career development for the artist. So those are just some of the few that are offered regionally. And like Mark was saying earlier, the availability of these courses are really thanks to the partnerships that we're able to have and maintain. And without those organizations helping the university by introducing us and partnering with us to be able to have instructors to come in as cultural experts to pass on these crafts, it, it really makes a big difference. Yeah, so. and I've said it quite a few times, the university's role is one of a facilitator. Yeah, so with the university helping to facilitate these opportunities for students, it's one of the many ways that we're able to preserve this very important aspect of our regional culture. Yeah, and hopefully uh, also being able to train future teachers. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I know that there's way more things that we could be talking about and could talk about, so hopefully... Here in the future, we'll be able to get you guys back in and maybe some of the other instructors as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, thanks for having us.